اهتم بسنته ويوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم ومن الذين امنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر اللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا اله الا الله امين يا رب العالمين ان شاء الله تعالى في 20 plus minutes that I have to share with you I'll first remind you if you don't already know of the source of the title that was offered to me following blizzard comes from a famous hadith narrated by Abu Sa'id al-Qudri radiallahu ta'ala in which the messenger essentially warned us you are no doubt going to follow the, the people, the legacies of those who came before you. People that came before us and when, just quickly paraphrasing, the companions asked him, are, are you referring to the Jews and the Christians? So then he said, Who else? Who else am I referring to? And in showing us the extent to which we will follow the nations who came before us, the messenger gave a parable, an example. And that was the example of if one of them was to go into or crawl into the hole of something like a lizard, right? Bump is kind of like a lizard. Then you would do the same. You would follow it just the same. First, a little bit about this example. You know, crawling into any animal's hole is illogical for human beings. It doesn't make any sense. And so one of the clear implications of this parable is if the people before you made mistakes that are utterly ridiculous, they don't make any sense at all, they are clearly harmful for you, you will still do them, even if they don't make any sense. And also there's something else. It is the imitation of an animal. You see, an animal behaves a certain way and a human being behaves another. Allah has dignified the human being while Allah comes on them the Adam. Without a doubt, we have already honored and dignified the human being, the children of Adam, the son of Adam. So now acting in a way that is not even becoming a decent human being. If they do so, you do so too. These are some of the direct implications of the profound words of our messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I'm pretty confident that all of you, if not most of you, have heard a khutbah or a talk about imitating those or following the path and the legacy of those who came before us. You've heard a khutbah about this before, and you have heard this hadith before too. I'm fairly confident. And typically the khatib, or the alim, the scholar, the one who is reminding you will tell you, well, we, follow, we shouldn't follow them in certain ways. For example, we shouldn't follow them in the way they dress. If they dress in ways that are inappropriate, that are not becoming of the standards that Allah has set for those who believe, then we shouldn't imitate them. We shouldn't follow them in that way. You may have heard someone tell you, well, if there's, a, if there's a certain culture, especially in high school in the United States, there's a certain culture. Something that I thought would be different from the Northeast where I used to live, when I, when I was in high school. It would be different in the South, it would be different in the West Coast. But I traveled the country, and I visited over 50 Muslim communities, I saw pretty much the same culture. And this is a culture in which there's a certain attitude that is almost glorified. There's an attitude that's glorified. So if you have a certain kind of walk, then that's respectable. A walk that basically, it, it projects yourself as an arrogant, full of yourself, conceited human being. But this is something we'll talk about. There's an entire industry, entire genres of music, where the, the songwriter and the singer will sing nothing about praising himself. There's an entire genre. This is Look up, I am this and I am that and I can do this and I have this much money and look at my car and look at my clothes and look at the ring on my finger and look at my watch. And this is glorified. And when you compare this to what Allah Azza wa has revealed, we glorify Allah Azza wa we humble ourselves. It's the exact opposite direction. So here you have kids, Muslim kids that are going to Sunday school, that are attending the khutbah at the masjid, and they have their iPod in their pocket, and in their iPod, the khatib is talking about humility and humbling yourself before Allah and put you in the salah, and after the khutbah they hit the play button on the MP3, and here's somebody singing about how great they themselves are. And arrogant. The irony of the whole thing. So this is one way of following, whichever way they go. This is one way, certainly. You know, our deen teaches us to clean up the way in which we speak. It's such a profound statement. Even to mention the name of corrupt things is horrible after you have iman. You can't even mention those things 
after you have money, because you're disgusted by mentioning terrible things. Yet we live in a culture where comedy, for example, has entirely to do with either shameless, vulgar things, obscene things, or funny, right? Every other joke has to do with something disgusting, something Muslims would never talk about, would never be entertained by, it, yet that's comedy. Or Allah Azza wa tells us, لَا يَسْخَطَ الْمُلْمِ الْأَوْمِنِ Though that one group, one nation, make fun of another nation, and what is comedy nowadays? Except for imitation of how the Chinese speak, or how the Indian speaks, or how the Arab speaks. One nation making fun of another. That's comedy for you. This guy does a really great imitation, and he mimics this other person very, very well. Therefore, he must be a great comedian. So they follow this path. And Allah tells us, don't make fun of another nation. And we say to ourselves, shut up, brother, it's just comedy. It's just, you know, it's all fun. It's just entertainment. You don't have to make such a big deal out of it. So what I'm trying to tell you is, we are following and being basically victimized by a legacy. We don't even realize we're following that track. We don't even realize it. I'll tell you something. Many of you here, they will know the parents. You might find this disturbing, but I have to share this with you. Your, your, your kids and the youth, even the religious youth, among themselves, just jokingly, they might mention something about homosexuality. They might make a joke about it. They might find it funny too. They might laugh at the bench that they're about. It. All that movie was really gay. And everybody's going to be laughing. Yet, when we use these words, who made these, this terminology mainstream? This is a word, and this is a concept, an idea, that the Muslim would never even consider bringing up in conversation, much less joke about it. And yet it's become part of the culture. It's so in our face all the time that even we have incorporated it into our daily conversation. This is a sign that there is a deterioration occurring. There's a problem that's happening. We are being desensitized. But at the same time, I do want to let you know that the, 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 the concern of my sharing these ideas with you is not to be condescending to another group of people not to say that we're better than the Jews and the Christians. By the end of the talk, inshallah, that will become clear. That's not the reason I'm telling you this. Because Muslims ride on this high horse too many times and fall flat on their face. At least we're not like that. What do you mean you're not like that? What's missing in you? So now, in the few ways in which we imitate or we have followed the nations before us, one of them, I want to share with you some ayat of the Quran that show us or Allah criticizes or basically awakes us up that we don't follow into that lizard soul, for instance, Allah Azza wa Jal tells us in Al-Baqarah, أَمْ تُرِيدُونَ أَنْ تَسْأَلُوا رَسُولَكُمْ كَمَا سُئِلَ مُوسَى مِنْ قَبْلُ Do you intend to question your messenger like Musa alayhi salam was questioned before? Is that what you want to do? And what this tells us from another hadith of the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, one of the three things that Allah does not like is kathra to su'al. Too many questions. Too many questions. If you look at a change in paradigm, a change in mentality, on the one hand, if you have the companions of the Messenger, they come to Rasulullah and they ask him, What more can I do to please Allah? Tell me something that will get me into Jannah. Tell me something that will bring me close to Allah. Tell me something I, a dhikr I can make that is the most reward. These are the questions the Sahaba are asking. Right? What more, how more they can become slaves of Allah? This is what they ask. You go across the Muslim world to a alim, a scholar, who gives a reminder to the people, he reminds them and he gives them something from the deen, he tells them words of the Rasul he tells them words of Allah, and you go to the Q&A session. What do people ask? People don't ask, what more can I do for Allah? They ask, what more dunya can I enjoy? Can I get that out of too? Is that how? Can I do that too? Can I have that too? Can I do this transaction? Can I that halal? Is that halal? Is that halal? Meaning, instead of asking what more I can do for Allah, we ask what more of dunya can we legitimize for ourselves? A change in mentality. Complete shift. Complete shift. Allah Azza wa asks us a rhetorical question. And so the thought, it's such a strange question. Right? It's a rhetorical question. Allah asks the believers, you, you are pleased with this world over the next. It's understandable if a captain is pleased with it. It's understandable if someone who doesn't know the pleasures of Jannah or the, the horrible things we need for them in the hellfire, they don't know that they only have this dunya. It's understandable. But you know and you are content with this dunya. What's wrong with you? Ma'alakum hal yahayakin. Ya ayyuhana bina amun ma'alakum. What is wrong with you? So now, this is one way, asking too many questions and asking questions that do 
loosen our relationship with this deen. We want to further distance ourselves from Allah's obedience rather than bringing ourselves you know, closer. Then another very interesting legacy within the Christian tradition that's a more subtle thing. I need you to pay attention if you understand this, inshallah. I pray you to tell you this in clear fashion. You know, the Christian tradition originally, for example, Catholicism that dominated the Christian world was an otherworldly kind of thing. Don't marry as an evil thing. If you want to reach the highest states of spirituality, deny worldly life. Be a monk. Live in the monastery. And there was an, almost a, an allergic reaction to that version of Christianity. Sorry, well, five minutes. Okay. There was an allergic reaction to that version of Christianity with the rise of the Protestant movement. And at the very end of the Protestant movement, you know what you have basically? A new Christianity. And in this Christianity, the more dunya you have, the more God loves you. If you listen to a preacher, he's evangelical, or anybody else, on a Sunday afternoon, they'll tell you, go get that promotion, God wants you to live well, get that second mortgage, refinance your house, get that new car, you need to show that God has blessed you. And this mentality, unfortunately, seeps its way into the Muslim mind, where we start thinking, I'm going to throw a party because I just got a house. Or I'm going to throw a party and I'm going to show people my new car. The more dunya we acquire, the more we celebrate. These are favors of Allah. But we have forgotten that all of these favors of Allah that are halal on us are not actually the reason for celebration. What we celebrate is the obedience to Allah. We have Eid at the end of obeying Allah, Ramadan. We have Eid at the end of performing the Hajj. Obedience to Allah is what we celebrate. Not dunya. Allah gave us something much better than dunya to celebrate. Yet we became people who feel we must be really good Muslims because Allah got me a really great job. And I have really good health. And I got my immigration cleared very quickly. Alhamdulillah, Allah must love me. Just like the two gardeners mentioned in Surah al Kahf, we don't have to have time to go into the story because I have four minutes. So, this is one way in which we follow the nations before us. Our mentality has changed. The way we think about dunya has changed. Allah tells us, Right? The day on which we gather you for that day of gathering, that is the day of winning and losing. This is not winning and losing. That's winning and losing. That day of gathering. So again, our mentality suffers a change. Finally, I'm going to skip a few things, inshallah ta'ala, and go straight to the last few things that I want to share with you. One of the ways in which we have followed the nations before us, and this is probably the scariest one, if I don't even get to finish the other four points I have, if I finish this one, I'm happy. And this one thing is the relationship this nation has, this Ummah has with its book, the Quran. Our Ummah was bestowed the great gift of Allah, just the final revelation of Quran. The Messenger of Allah tells us in an authentic hadith, Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Ya ahl al-Qur'an People of Qur'an La tatabassam al-Qur'an Wa tlubu haqqa ila wadihi min alai al-layli wa al-nahar I'll come to the meaning of hadith This hadith at the end The people who came before us You tell me now I want to listen to the answer from the audience You tell me Were the people before us given books? They were given books What was Bani Israel given? Which book? They were given? Salat Allah Azza wa Jal talks about that nation and the relationship they had with their book. He talks about that nation and the relationship they had with which book? Which book? At-Tawar. He says, وَمِنْهُمْ أُمِّيُّونَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ الْكِتَابَ إِلَّا أَمَانِي وَإِنْهُمْ إِلَّا يَقُلُّونَ Among them, among the Israelites, they are unlettered people. Uneducated, not educated in terms of finance or accounting or medicine, uneducated in terms of their own book. They don't know the book except their own wishful thoughts, amani. Amani means wishful thoughts. They don't know what it says, they think they know what it says. That's all they know. What in whom they know, they do nothing more than make assumptions. That's all they do. They don't really know their book, the Torah, they just make assumptions about it. Now, I want to share with you what Ibn Abbas and Qatada what they said about this ayah. I want to share with you what they said about this ayah and my point is done. What they said about this ayah is amani. Amani, which is their crime. 
They reduced the relationship with themselves and Allah to just amani, which will cause. They said, amani and tilawa. Ya'lamuna uhibban wa qira'atan biya fahm la yudruna ma biha. Indama yaqtasiruna ala ma yuta'alayhi. They said, amani in this ayah means all these people do is tilawa. You know what tilawa means? Who here knows what tilawa means? Let me hear it. Recitation? All they know about Ta'ala is what? Recitation. Ya'lamuna hu hibban. They know it in terms of hib. You know what hib is? They know it in terms of memorizing some parts of it. What qira'atan? You know what qira'a is? Recitation again? The only thing they do with their book is they memorize some parts of it and they recite some parts of it. La yadduna ma fiha. They don't know what's inside. The only thing they know is they memorize some things and they recite some things. And that's it. They're very happy even if somebody recites it to them. That's enough for them. This is the description of a Sahabi Ibn Abbas Fasl Quran of what they did with their book. Now the topic of my speech was going into the lizard's hole. What do we do with our book? You go across that I'm not gonna be talk, I'm not gonna talk uh, talk down to the Muslims living in Bangladesh or in Egypt or in Pakistan or in Indonesia or in Turkey. Forget all of that. Let's go across the United States. Let's travel to the Muslim communities across the United States. MashaAllah, well-educated community. Is the vast majority of them people that love their book, that recite their book, that memorize their book. But the vast majority of them has no idea what the book says. Is that true or no? Subhanallah. The description is of a sahabi, of the nation of Lord. That's the thing that scares me the most. May Allah Azza wa Jal make us truly a people of Qur'an and again, I know my time is up, I'll just tell you the meaning of that hadith I shared with you in the beginning and I'm done inshaAllah ta'ala. O people of Qur'an, ya ahl Qur'an. La tatawassal al-Qur'an, don't become complacent with the Qur'an, don't become lazy with the Qur'an. It's not a pillow for you to relax on. وَتْلُهُ حَقَّ تِلَاوَتِهِ لِلْأَلَاءِ لَيْلِ وَالْنَهَارِ Read and follow it as it deserves to be read and followed in all hours of the night and day. وَفْشُوهُ and spread it with our love and beautify it. What does the book be and reflect deeply in it? So that all of you may succeed. Allahumma ja'ala min al-mutlihin. Barakallahu alayhi wa sallam.